welcome to our series of programs titled 15 Parables Unveiled and Understood. We have already covered the first five. Today we're going to be covering Precious Pearl and Lost Sheep. The parables of the sower of the seeds and the wheat and the tares, which are the first two that you see here, they illustrate the different responses to the gospel and the different fates of the responders. Based on how people respond, and there are different responses, these responders have different fates. So based on their response, there's a different fate. The parable of the mustard seed, which we covered, that's number three, the parable of the mustard seed showed us the growth of the kingdom of God from being the only kingdom that is not visible to being the only kingdom that is visible. And the parables of the leaven and that was hidden, and then the hidden treasures, number four and five, those parables showed us that the hidden person behind the successful growth of the kingdom of God is Yeshua. They emphasize us seeking Yeshua. And the next two parables, the precious pearl, the lost sheep, the ones that we're going to cover today, these two parables emphasize Yeshua seeking us. Not only are we responsible for seeking Yeshua, but the beautiful, wonderful thing, the marvelous thing, the comforting thing, is that Yeshua seeks after us. Let's talk about the precious pearl first. <clears throat> This is in Matthew chapter 13, and verses 45 through 46. Matthew chapter 13, and verses 45 through 46. We're going to see three aspects that we should consider in this parable. The first one is the pearl. This is to help us to understand the parable as we're reading through it. The pearl represents you. You are the pearl. Then there's the person. The person in this parable is Yeshua, or Yahweh. And then the possessions are Yeshua. The pearl, that's you. The person, Yahweh. The possessions, Yeshua. Keep those three things in mind. The pearl, you. The person, Yahweh. The possessions, Yeshua. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, let's see how this plays out. In similar fashion, the kingdom of heaven is light. These are all kingdom parables. These are all mysteries that are made, the understanding of them, are made available to us who have the Spirit of God, but they are hidden, therefore they remain mysteries to people who do not have the Spirit of God. Kingdom of Heaven is like a person who is a merchant seeking fine pearls. The merchant is the person, and we said that this merchant is Yahweh, who is seeking fine pearls, who having found one precious pearl, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the possessions actually is Yeshua, uh, the person is Yahweh. So it's talking here that this merchant is Yahweh, seeking fine pearls, who having found one precious pearl, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the possessions that were sold so that the pearl could be bought, that's Yeshua. Please keep that in mind. You are the precious pearl. The merchant is Yahweh, <coughs> Yahweh Elohim. The possessions represent Yeshua. How is this all going to play out? That's the parable. How is it going to play out? In John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. This is John chapter 3, and verses 14 through 17. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he was lifted up on the cross, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He's also lifted up by our voices, all of us who preach the gospel. We lift up our voices and we say, look at Yeshua. And then because he is presented, the Father can draw whoever he wants to Yeshua to choose them to be in his family. So he's lifted up 
terms that he was crucified, he's also lifted up and that he was resurrected. And we lift him up in terms of glorifying him, saying, look at him because he is salvation. All those ways he's lifted up and then people who believe in him will have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, and I'm adding the word sold, and that's a proper word to add. I know the scripture says don't add or take anything away. It means don't add or take away any meaning from the scripture. The meaning is true, and we're going to prove that. We always prove things through the scripture. So it is very proper to add this word to help us to understand it. For God so loved the world, God the Father, who in this case is also Yahweh, because Yahweh, Elohim, is used for both the Father and the Son in the Old Testament. Both are called Yahweh. In this case is Yahweh the Father, not Yahweh the Son. For Yahweh or Elohim or God, the Father so loved the world that he gave or sold his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. God is not judging the world right now in terms of eternal death. He did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order to save the world through him. And he's only offering salvation to some people. The gospel of salvation goes out to all people, but God knows because he's blind to most people and only God can take the blinders off their eyes, that most people are not truly having their first chance to know Yeshua because they can't see Yeshua for who he is because they're blind. They can't hear the truth about Yeshua because they're deaf. Their ears are stopped up. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 now, verses 8 through 10. Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. What woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one, doesn't light a lamp, sweep the house, and search thoroughly until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls her friend, saying, Come on, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin I lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You can also see Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. And in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says Yeshua came to seek and to save those who were lost. So this woman is a type of Yeshua who is seeking this precious pearl. Okay? And is really a type of the Father who is uh, seeking this precious pearl. All right, let's go on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, don't you know, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. And while you're turning in, let me again review. It's the Father who's the merchant. He's looking for this pearl of great price. That's you. So the Father's looking for you. And this merchant goes and sells all that he has to purchase the pearl. Our Father sold Yeshua, so to speak, we're going to see that in the scripture, in order to purchase you and me, all of us who are the first fruits, who are true Christians. And so the first part is where we're talking about this person, and I'm just going to go back for a second. So the first part is where we were looking in John chapter 3, where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave or sold his only son. So that's the father who's the merchant. He's selling his son, so to speak, his possessions, so that he can save the world. The world is us first. We are the first fruits. And then the father is actually the one who's likened to a woman who lost the coin. She swept the house, and she found the coin, and then says to everybody else, Rejoice with me, because I found the coin that I lost. Again, the coin is like this precious pearl that has been found, because the whole world is lost, and only the ones who are found are the ones who the Father chooses to find, so to speak. <clears throat> so now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Don't you know, don't you not know, 
That's probably should be, don't you know? That's what it's supposed to be. So sorry for that error. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Again, we always use Scripture to prove Scripture. We never say anything that's this wild speculation that's our own imagination. We let the Scripture explain the Scripture. Does it say that you were bought for a price? Well, what's the currency being used to buy us? The currency being used to buy us is Yeshua. The Father is buying us with Yeshua. Don't you know that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to God, and he purchased us with the currency of his son. That's why we can say the merchant, who's the father, went and sold all that he had, all of his possessions. Yeshua is more valuable than anything else. He is our all in all. So when the Father gave him up, he gave up everything in order to purchase us. That's how precious we are in our Father's sight. Please let that sink in. You might be going through troublous times. You might feel like our Father has forsaken you. But he has never forsaken you. Yeshua, when he took upon himself our sins, even said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt so alone. Even Yeshua felt alone. So there's not a criticism for anybody who feels alone, who feels like they might have been forsaken. It happens. But was Yeshua forsaken? No. Of course, he was resurrected from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father now, having received the glory that he had before he came down from heaven in the first place. And in one sense, he has even more glory because he's the firstborn from the dead to receive eternal life. And he is the first of the first fruits, meaning that many others will be born into eternal life. And that's why Yeshua said, for the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy? The joy of knowing that he, after he came off of the cross, and after he came out of the grave, that he would be the one to lead other people into glory. He is the trailblazer. He is the pioneer and captain of our salvation. <clears throat> That's how precious we are in our Father's sight. That's how precious we are to Yeshua, that both of them devised this marvelous plan this really incomparable display of love where the Father gave up all of his possessions to purchase us, to redeem us to himself. And Yeshua said, yes, I will be that perfect sacrifice. I will be that perfect currency that allows you to redeem people to yourself. <clears throat> In 1 Peter chapter 1 now, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. You need to know that you were not redeemed from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers with corruptible things like silver or gold. That is not how God redeems us. That's not the possession that he used. The merchant didn't go and sell all of his gold and silver in that sense of the word. That merchant went and sold his son. You are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Now verse 19. But you are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. That's our currency. The death of Yeshua is our currency. We were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot or blemish. This has been foreknown before the foundation of the world but has been revealed for you in these last times. Now, before I go, let me make one other comment. 
before we go on to the next one. So this parable is about Yeshua seeking us. The next parable that we're going to see, which is the lost sheep, is also about Yeshua seeking us, both Jew and Gentile. That's the emphasis is going to be that he's seeking us, and us is defined as both physical Jews and physical Gentiles all coming into the family of God. But this first one, we've pictured the tremendous, awesome, incomparable love that our Father has for us, that He would give up His Son, who's more valuable than all life combined, He would give up His Son, in a sense sell His Son, to redeem us. His Son is the currency to redeem us from death, to bring us to life. His Son is salvation, and salvation means being saved from death, saved to life, being saved from trash, being saved to treasure. Yeshua is the currency that our Father used to purchase us. We are that pearl of great price. Isn't it wonderful that they have that much love for us, that they view us as that valuable, where they would give up everything to have us? The question is, will you give up everything to have them? Again, we might think about, oh, why have you forsaken me? My wife is divorcing me. My husband is divorcing me. I kept myself pure. I did not commit fornication. I kept myself pure until I would be married. I married somebody, quote, in the church, unquote. I did all the right things. And my husband has run off and committed adultery with this woman. How can that be? How would you let that happen? You have forsaken me. I've kept your word. I've followed you. And now look what you've done to me, what you've allowed well, our Father might allow stuff like that to happen. It's not that He wants it to happen. You're just talking about a knucklehead man uh, that did some wicked stuff. That's not God's doing. He is not forsaken. He knows what you're going through. Was Yeshua cheated on? Was Yahweh cheated on? Yahweh, Yeshua, many cases are the same. Yeshua in the New Testament, Yahweh, same being in the Old Testament. Was Yeshua, was Yahweh um, cheated on? Yes. Yahweh was married to Israel. Israel committed idolatry, adultery. He had to divorce her. And so he knows what you're going through. And it's just so wonderful to know that they will give everything to have us. Will we even say, okay, you allowed my husband to go, but I still love you. What about if you've lost a child? Well, God is almighty. He could have presented prevented that from happening. Why did he allow my child to be hit by a car or to have a disease and die? I tried to raise my child in the church, teaching them the right thing. Look at all these kids running around here that are thieves, that are drug addicts, that are molesting little boys. How come they live to be 70, 80 years old? How come some of them don't even go to jail? That seems to be unfair. How come you have forsaken me and their blessed? Well, of course, that's nonsense. God hasn't forsaken you. He loves you. And the most important thing is for each and every one of us to have salvation. And that is what they have provided. So to go from where we didn't exist at one point to the point where we will exist throughout eternity, that's a pretty good deal. We didn't exist at one point. And you're talking about existing throughout eternity and having wealth beyond our imagination, having health because we won't die, we won't have any sickness, there won't be any crying, there won't be any tears, there won't be any sorrow. It's going to be only good stuff and most likely, hopefully, that same child that died will also accept Yeshua as their Savior, as their Lord, and you will see them again. They will live throughout eternity along with you. So... No, we haven't lost anything. We gain everything. That's the way to look at it. So yes, it is worth it for us to give up everything to get everything. And everything that we give up is really nothing compared to what we're going to have. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's the perspective that our Father and our Lord want us to have. So now let's go on to the parable about the lost sheep. And this is in Luke chapter 15 and verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 15 and verses 1 through 7. 
This is the parable about the lost sheep. And again, this is talking about God seeking us, us being defined as both Jew and Gentile, all of us needing to come into one family. As usual, we have some points to consider. In this case, there's four points to consider in this parable that will help us to understand this mystery. There's a shepherd in this parable. That shepherd represents Yeshua. There are sheep. That represents sinners. There are scholars, and that represents the saints. And then there's the furnace, and that represents, as you can probably guess, judgment. So I'll give you a chance to write those down. There are four aspects to consider in this parable. There's a shepherd who represents Yeshua. There's sheep that represents sinners. There's scholars that represent saints. And then there's the furnace that represents judgment. All right, this is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 15, starting out in verses 1 through 3. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear Yeshua. The Pharisees and the Torah scholars began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Yeshua told them this parable. Again, understanding this, tax collectors and sinners were drawn near to hear Yeshua, and the Pharisees and the Torah scholars began to complain, saying, This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. They did not understand who Yeshua was. They did not understand what God expects of us as true believers, as true representatives of God. These Jewish people were supposed to be the true representatives of God. These Torah scholars, these Pharisees, and in some translations for Torah scholars, you'll see scribes, the people who learned the scriptures and wrote them, again and again, copying them down faithfully. And they accused Yeshua of welcoming sinners, the tax collectors and the sinners who were despised. Yeshua told them this parable to deal with this false paradigm that they had, and they, of course, were self-righteous. And what we have to understand is that Yeshua is a shepherd for all people. Yeshua in this parable is the shepherd. He's a shepherd for all people. The Pharisees and scribes, which are the Torah scholars, they devalue others who were not like them, i.e. the tax collectors, metaphorically, in this case, Gentiles, because we're going to see that a little bit later in the story. So these tax collectors and sinners were considered Gentiles to these Pharisees and Torah scholars because these Pharisees and Torah scholars felt like they were the true representatives and these people over here, they were like Gentiles, even though they were Jews, but they were like Gentiles who needed to be cast aside. And, of course, we as true Christians, though we do condemn false teachings, we do not condemn people who follow the false teachings. And that's the difference between those of us who do have the truth, and we know there are others who don't have the truth, but it's not being in a self-righteous way looking down upon them. We know that it is God who has given us understanding and has, for whatever reason, not given some other people understanding yet. He will, but he just hasn't done it yet. He has a divine timeline, a divine plan, which he's working perfectly. So Luke chapter 15, verse 4 now. Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. Which man among you, if he has 100 sheep and loses one of them, will not leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after the lost one until he finds it? This is the parable he's telling you. Which man among you, if he has 100 sheep and loses one of them, will not leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after the lost one until he finds it. So you see a person with a hundred sheep, then you see this shepherd who's looking for the one lost sheep. In other words, the people who are devalued, the lost sheep, the tax collectors, the sinners, the Torah scholars and the scribes, they were like, oh, we're the 99 and we're cool. Why are you going after tax collectors and sinners? Why are you going after this one lost sheep? 
Well, again, these parables are talking about how the Father and Yeshua seek after us, just like we have to seek after them. Just like we need to value them, they definitely do value us. So they will go and seek after us. They are seeking after both Jew and Gentiles. Luke chapter 15, verses 5 through 6 now. Luke chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. When he has found this lost sheep, he puts it on his shoulders, which you can see in the picture over to the left. He's putting it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and says, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. And the lesson for the scribes and the Pharisees is that no one is a lost cause just because. No one is a lost cause just because. Just because they're not like us. Just because they don't go to the same congregation. Just because they don't believe the same exact things as us. So no one is a lost cause just because. Now there is truth and there is error and we need to stand up for the truth and it is true to say that some people do not have the truth. They're deceived. They're worshiping God maybe in spirit but not in truth with falsehoods. But we're still not saying that they're lost. And that's again a difference. We are not making judgment on people as to their eternal fate. We know that when God opens up their eyes, that will be their first chance and their only chance to understand who Yeshua is, to accept Him as their Savior and Lord. But the lesson for the scribes and the Pharisees is that no one is a lost cause just because. Like Yeshua, we should esteem everyone worthy of salvation. I'm hoping that everybody who hears my voice, whether it's a white supremacist or whether it is somebody who, somebody else who would like to kill me, I don't care who it is, I hope when they hear this word of truth that they will repent of their sins, they will repent of who they are, they will accept Yeshua because they see that we're all created in God's image and God's likeness that we're all a part of one big family. So even the person that hates me the most, that wants me to perish, I should love that person and know that that person is worthy of being saved, of being salvaged, knowing that Yeshua can salvage that wicked, perverted mind that is so evil that they think they need to wipe somebody out because they think they're superior, when actually they are inferior because they have inferior thoughts, trying to elevate one person above another. They are worthy of salvation. And so in love, I hope that these people will repent at the preaching of the gospel. There must be love and unity in the body of Christ, the church, the kingdom of heaven. All right? Everybody is worthy of salvation, and God will offer salvation to everyone. Jewish people, you have to love Nazis. Uh, let's see. As black people, we need to love the white people who enslaved our ancestors, as an example. And again, the white supremacists. Anybody who's been oppressed, you still need to love your oppressors. Pray for them that they repent of their sins. Pray for them that they become different people because they have a different spirit. The Spirit of God now is in them to transform them from their wickedness to righteousness. Now Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Luke chapter 15 and verse 7. I tell you, in the same way, according to this parable, where a person who has a hundred sheep, they lose one, they go after that person. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one repenting sinner than over the 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Now what it's saying is, you can take this in two different ways. The scribes and the Pharisees are the 99 sheep that are really lost but don't know it because they feel they have no need of repentance. And that's what he's really talking about. I'm going to rejoice over 
other people who you look down upon, whether it is another physical Jew or whether it's a Gentile, these people that you look down upon thinking that you don't need repentance because you've already repented, yeah, heaven rejoices over this person because they have repented and they will become a part of the true church, a part of the true body of Christ, a part of the kingdom of heaven. They are the first fruits. They will be in the first resurrection. The 99 quote righteous people, which are self-righteous, who think they have no need for repentance, there's no rejoicing over them. So that's one way to think of it. And that's the way I see the scripture. But some people have said, and I can see a little bit of validity to this, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one repenting sinner than over the 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. That might be saying, at one point, there are a hundred people who are in the church, in a particular congregation, and let's assume that all of them are faithful believers, so they're all righteous, but one of them backslides. One of them starts to fall away from the truth. They are one who becomes lost. They've lost their way because they're not following the way, the truth, and the life. They're following their own way, so they become lost. Well, if 99 have already repented and been righteous, the rejoicing has already occurred. It's this person who used to be in the group who has lost their way. Yeah, when that person comes back, when they're reawakened, when they're revived, then there is great rejoicing. It's like, oh, it's so good to see you again. I'm glad we're together again. So that could be the way that this is also taken. But since he was talking to the scribes and the Torah scholars, I believe it's the first way, which is you consider yourselves righteous. You don't think you need repentance. I'm rejoicing over the one who recognizes that they need repentance because I'm seeking after people who want to accept me as their Savior and their Lord. That's who I rejoice over. Now, lost sheep. Lost sheep is any person led astray from the truth, and the truth is Yeshua. Any person who's led astray from Yeshua. And speaking of Israel, through Jeremiah, Yahweh says, My people are like lost sheep. My people are like lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. This is in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 6. Now think about this for a second. Speaking to physical Israelites back in the time of Jeremiah, which would have been probably in the 600s, yeah, it would have been in the 600s B.C., before Christ, is when Jeremiah was prophesying. And Jeremiah is saying, Yahweh says, my people, because at that time, Yahweh was in covenant with the physical nation of Israel. That was the old covenant. So he considered them his people. There was no other people on the face of the earth that were in covenant with him. And by the way, again, Israel is a type of the church in that God has one nation right now. That is the church, just like Israel was a small nation compared to the multitude of nations covering the face of the earth. The church is a small group of people compared to all of the non-believers. And that should tell you something. The church is not this big, visible church that you see. It's called the Catholic Church. It's called the Protestant Churches. Those are not churches of God. They are false churches, churches of Satan and the devil. There are good people in them, but they follow the devil's teachings, and that's because they're deceived. So my people are lost. These people today are in churches, and they're lost. My people are like lost sheep. Why? Because they're shepherds. They're reverends, and there's no person who's reverend. They're fathers. There's nobody who's a father in that sense of the word. They're so-called apostles. None of these people who claim to be apostles are apostles. Uh, these evangelists, these bishops, your shepherds have led you astray. Yeshua and his disciples came to Israel first to offer them salvation. Yeshua and the disciples came to these lost sheep, the physical Israelites, first to offer them salvation. That happened from 26 A.D. up until 50 A.D. 
from 26 AD to 30 AD, the three and a half years of Yeshua, his ministry. And then after that, the 12 apostles and the other disciples took over. They preached, and it was exclusively to Israelites, to Jewish people, up until around 50 AD. So from 30 AD to 50 AD. <clears throat> and then around 50 AD, the gospel went to Gentiles. So Yeshua and his disciples came to Israel first to offer them salvation. So they were like lost sheep. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Yeshua sent out the 12 disciples and ordered them, do not go to the Gentiles and do not enter into any Samaritan town, but go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when it talks about go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, again, this is not talking about the northern 12 tribes that are known as the lost tribes of Israel. It's not talking about go to them. It is talking about that the Israelites who were right there in Jerusalem, they were the ones who were considered the lost sheep. And that's what he's saying. Yeshua sent out the 12 disciples and ordered them, do not go to the Gentiles. So he didn't go to Gentile lands. They didn't go to Gentile lands. And do not enter into any Samaritan town. Not only did they not go to any Gentile lands, they didn't go to any towns in which the Samaritans dominated. And the Samaritans were people who were imported into that area, which would be the northern part of Israel, imported into that area. They were exported from places where the Assyrians had people that they had taken captive. They sent them to be in the northern part of Israel. Then, of course, the southern house of Israel, they went into captivity under Jeremiah's time. They came back to the southern part. So you had people in the north that were really Gentiles, some Gentiles mixed with Jews, but they were looked at as Samaritans because they really didn't follow the truths of God. Again, in the northern house of Israel, you remember that Jeroboam led people astray. He changed the seven annual appointments from this, the last four of the seven, from the seventh month to the eighth month. And he instituted priests that were not Levitical priests. So the north was always the worst off. Trace the history of Israel. You know that the Israelites kings after the kingdom split. You had the house of Israel in the north and the house of Judah in the south. The Israelite kings were evil and they went downhill, straight downhill. The southern house of Judah, they had some evil kings, but then they have a good king. There'd be a revival, then the evil king would come, then the good king would come. But eventually, of course, they descended into pure evil. They also were sent into captivity. But these Samaritan towns were filled with either lukewarm or spiritually dead, really, even in terms of Judaism, um, is physical Israelites or physical Israelites mixed with Gentiles from wherever the Assyrians had exported them and imported them here, or just pure Gentiles. So that's why he's saying, do not go to the Gentiles, do not enter into any Samaritan town, but go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who you need to focus on. So whether one of the Israelites is in the northern part, because obviously Yeshua and the disciples did a lot of ministry around the Sea of Galilee. So whether you find Israelites there, or whether you find them in the central part around Jerusalem, or where you find them in the south, past the Negev Desert, no matter where Israelites are, physical Israelites, they are considered the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And again, we read in Jeremiah 50, verse 6, that my people are like lost sheep. And this is speaking to Israelites, and primarily to the Jews. That's who Jeremiah was speaking to. And when Yeshua came on the scene, that's who was in Israel, were the Jews, because again, the ten tribes had already been taken captive by Sennacherib, the Assyrians, never to return to the land and so they became known as the Lost Ten Tribes. But this is different. It's talking about every Israelite who was in the land at the time. 
They know that they're Israelites. They're not lost to anybody, but they're lost spiritually speaking because their shepherds had led them astray. So they were like lost sheep because they didn't have a shepherd that was leading them to green pastures, to still waters. And he says, go and proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand because Yeshua represented the kingdom. And his 11 disciples, because not Judas, also represented the kingdom. Since most Israelites rejected Yeshua, the gospel afterwards went to Gentiles. Again, we saw that where Paul was sent to the Gentiles. That happened about 50 AD. In Acts chapter 13, verses 45 through 46. This is Acts chapter 13, verses 45 through 46. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousy and contradicted the things which were spoken by Paul and blasphemed. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that God's word should be spoken to you first, since indeed you thrust it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. This parable is about Yeshua seeking us, first the Jews, secondarily the Gentiles. But all of us are like pearls of great price that God the Father is seeking to purchase, and he uses the currency of his Son and his son's blood specifically to redeem us from the curse of the law, to save us from eternal death, to save us to eternal life. A beautiful picture. That's what these two parables have been teaching us. Now, in our next program, we're going to be talking about the parable of the unforgiving servant. I thank you very much for tuning in to this program. I hope you'll join us for the next program.